Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to Jerusalem Presbyterian Church on this glorious Sunday morning. Do we have any announcements before we begin? I'm getting a little bit nervous seeing all those boxes of books down there. Uh, if the month of August goes as fast as the month of July, we're going to be really rushed for getting the books sorted. So we're going to sort books after coffee on Monday and at 3 o'clock on Thursday afternoon. So if you can join us for either of those, it'd be great. Well, we're getting down to almost four weeks now to the art fair. We have six sign-up sheets. I brought two new ones today. One for cookies and bars that we're going to do uh, in the food booth this year again. And also, um, there's another one that's for parking, assistant, and oh, I can't even remember now what it is. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. There's plenty of room for everybody to work. Do you have a nickname? Yeah. Yeah, what's your nickname? Zack Attack. Zack Attack? Yeah? People call you Zack Attack? Now, is your full name Zack or is it Zachary? It's Zachary. So Zack already is a nickname, and then we have a variant of the nickname in Zack Attack. Yeah. Lily, does, does anybody call you anything other than Lily? Not really. Not really? Your phone name's Liliana. Okay, so you, yes, that's also like my name is Andrew, but everyone calls me Andy. Right? Some people have them. Some people don't really have them, and that's that's very common. So, I was trying to think the other day of how many nicknames I have, and Sophia and I were talking about this too. And you got up to what like fifteen different variants of what people call you, that are you know variants of. Sophia, Sophie, Fia, Fifi, you know, like a lot of, you know, that's how you pad the count up to, up to 15. And I'm the same way. Um, I go by Andrew, of course, my, my regular name, Andy. Uh, some, very few people are allowed to call me Drew. The only people that are allowed to call me Drew actually are my siblings, Amy, Derek, and Dan. Uh, they're also allowed to, to expand out that out to Drewy because I'm the youngest. i am also been nicknamed Trailblazer. I've been nicknamed, because I got good navigation skills, the best in, in the family. Uh, well, no, that, it's, it's true. Uh, but there are a couple I want to tell you about. My brother, when he was in high school, at, they had basically the band banquet where they gave funny awards at the end. And it was either his freshman or sophomore year. And, and somebody was like, congratulations, Dan, your name is now Narfu. You are the king of creamed corn. It was high scores acting weird. I don't know why they came up with this Dan's order, so I, I wasn't there. So when I was in the high school band, they then were like, well, we need a, na a name for Narfu's brother. And so I was called Garfla, G-A-R-F-L-A. And then there was one other name I want to tell you about when I was in high school. It was because I was on the wrestling team. Right, Austin, you're on the wrestling team? And I'm sure you are much better at it than I was. Because I was a big kid who had to wrestle against the same weight class, but I was big but not strong. And I really, in high school, I didn't know how to use my body. I didn't, know, I didn't have the, the killer instinct in wrestling to do whatever I had to do to wrestle well. And so one day the coach said, Andy, you're, you're like a bear, but you're a panda bear. <laughs> and so they started to call me panda bear, and then that was just shortened to panda. The funny thing is we've got another bear in the family. So Sophia, one of her nicknames is Sophia Bear or Fia Bear. Totally separate from, she probably never knew that I was actually called a variant of bear in my high school time as well. But I was thinking about this when I was thinking of nicknames today, of Fia Bear and Panda Bear and Trailblazer and Garfla and, and all these things. Because sometimes nicknames are ones that you like, like Zack Attack, that's really cool. But sometimes there are nicknames like in college, I mainly went by my last name. 
homes. Because homes was a very popular word in the 90s. Hey, homes, what are you doing? Hey, homie. And I hated it. I would be like, my name is Andy. It's not homes. Which, when you're in college, that just eggs them on to call you homes more. But the funny thing is, I don't mind being called homes now, but the thing that I want to drive home to y'all is it didn't occur to me till years later that being called Panda Bear on the wrestling team might not have been a compliment. <laughs> don't, don't take that away. Well, no, but like, I thought it was fine. I was happy to be one of the team. I never made varsity. I just had my head pounded in the mat all the way through junior year, and by the time I was a senior, I, was, I had learned that wrestling was not for me. But I've always actually loved it because even though I've always been a bigger guy, I also am smiling and outgoing, and I would like to think of myself as fun. And so being called Panda Bear actually kind of fits. So even though I, don't, I still don't know to this day whether the coach meant it as a dig or not or whatever, I think he probably just thought it up because he was seeing me, you know, being too happy at wrestling and not getting anywhere with the actual wrestling. But the point is, we get to define ourselves, even when people give us names. So if you're ever given a nickname that you don't like, I know it's hard, but just let it roll off your back as much as you can, because kids are mean, and here's the truth, adults sometimes are mean too. So as long as we can learn that at, an, at a younger age, I think that serves us really well. Whether we're Panda Bear or Garfla or Fia Bear, just remember that we get to define ourselves. We don't have other people define who we are through our names. You got it? All right, let's have a prayer. Great Lord, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to talk with the kids each week and also have the adults hear what our conversation is, that we may all be better for it, that we all may take value from it in whatever value you place on our hearts. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is who has traveled the furthest to be here today? Who thinks they've traveled the furthest? You guys think you've traveled the furthest? I don't think so. Do we have somebody else who's traveled the furthest to be here? So, so where, where do you live, sir? I live in Athens, Ohio. Athens, Ohio. So south of Columbus. So if you're driving from Milwaukee, you would actually get to Detroit before you would get to Athens, Ohio. So sorry, Amy and Via, this gentleman over here, we're so glad you're here in worship with us today. And we are going to give you a place of prominence then. You are going to pick what scripture that Rebecca is going to read. So our, our choices, your choices today are one, five, three, and seven. What number would you like Zach to pull? Three. All right. Zach, you would pull number three. And so you'll be reading Matthew 4. 18 through 22. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left their boat and their father and followed him. Would you pick a second number for us? Your choices are one, five, and seven. 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 Number seven is Mark 7, 24 through 30. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. 
Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Are the call of the disciples and the Syrophoenician woman coming to Jesus. So both of them are Jesus encountering people. Who here has heard the call of the disciples story before? Oh, come on. I, I want to see every hand go up. <laughs> Lie to your pastor if you have to. Because the more uncommon one or the less heard one is the Syrophoenician's daughter. Who here has actually heard that one? A, a handful of people, right? It's, it's, it's famous, but it's not famous as I will make you fish for people kind of famous, right? So the difference between these two scriptures, one is Jesus at the beginning of his ministry rounding up the first of his crew. And the second is when he's gained some popularity, some notoriety. So what does the beginning of that passage say? It says he went to this town, Tyre, which, which was an, not in the heart of, of uh, where the Jewish people lived. He was on kind of the outskirts, right? And he just wants to be left alone. But did you catch what it said? People found him anyways. So in the first story, he is finding the people. In the second story, the people are finding him. Now, the Syrophoenician woman story is, I think, of, of all the ones that I put on that board. Now, y'all need to know I picked them in April and I've slept since then, so my brain is foggy as to what the other two selections might actually be, which we'll probably get to on the art fair weekend. But the Syrophoenician woman is probably the hardest scripture I put up there. Do you know why? Because it's not the Jesus that we normally know. What do I mean by that? This woman who seeks him out, who needs his help. Her daughter is sick. And what does he tell her? He says, that's not my concern. It's there. You might not have picked up on it when he says, the children must be fed first and then the dogs. What he's saying is, the Jewish people are to receive God's grace. And if there is any left, any healing, any insight, any wisdom, then eh, we'll see what we can do for your daughter. But not until everybody in the inner circle is taken care of first. That's really hard to hear. Because we see Jesus as one who helps everyone in front of him, right? And so this is one of the few stories where you kind of think, did Jesus get this wrong? And what does the woman respond with? She takes his uh, proverb, right? The children are fed before the dogs and flips it around and says, even the dogs eat up what the children drop on the floor, the crumbs they leave. If you've ever had a dog, you know that she speaks the truth. There is no such thing as a five second rule in a family that has a dog, because within two and a half seconds, the food is usually gone. So this story is kind of one where Jesus is, I don't know, is it proved wrong? Is he shown faulty in his theology or in his logic or his understanding of God. Like, it's just really foreign to us, right? Usually Jesus is the one laying the hammer down of philosophy on others. And in this case, he gets it put back on him. Now, there's a cop-out we can use. We can say, well, 
Jesus was probably just testing her to see if she believed. Jesus was probably testing her faith. You know, what we'd call throwing a pitch in the dirt to see if she swings at it. And she swung at the pitch in the dirt and hit a home run. But I don't know if that's exactly where we need to line up here. Do we believe that Jesus in Scripture can learn something? Can Jesus in Scripture change? The big challenge of this story is it puts a mirror up against our understanding of our Lord and Savior. Now, the good thing is he comes around in the end and he says, good point, your argument is valid. You know, we don't understand it this way, but it's a very Jewish way of thinking. I remember uh, when I met Amy Jo Levine, who's a, who's a famous New Testament professor at Vanderbilt. I think she's retired now. Uh, and the crazy thing about Amy, Amy Jo Levine being a New Testament professor, she's Jewish. And she was at Vanderbilt Divinity, and she came and, and spoke at our home church, University of Presbyterian Church, uh, what, five years ago, eight years ago, something like that. And I asked her a question, because it was one of these like, oh, you're bringing in her. I think I'll travel on over and listen to her. And she was talking about things like how do we interpret things, right? How do we argue about scripture? How do we argue about faith? And, and I said, you know, Professor Jolivine, how do we know who is right or who is authentic, right? We talk about authentic scripture, authentic interpretations a lot. The word in Christianity is called orthodox, right? What's orthodox versus unorthodox? What's correct? And she said, you're thinking about it totally wrong when, when you're asking about how Judaism interprets. Christianity, through its history, has been about picking winners and losers. That, I mean, that's what the early church councils were. The Council of Nicaea, the Council of Chal Chalcedon, they got in a room, they fought it out, and some had a victory lap and some were walking home, right? And unfortunately, that's also a really dark side of our history. The Spanish Inquisition, other things of that nature, right? Like when you're in the habit of picking winners and losers, the losers are not always treated super well. She said Judaism is, is the opposite. We fight about things, we talk about it, we wrestle with who God is and what God means and all of this, and then we shake hands and we go out and have brunch. To them, their, their, their faith is more, it's, it's not about salvation, it's more of an intellectual exercise of becoming a better person. So she said, her final thought was, if you can argue it properly, if you can make your case, like, like the woman does in the Syrophoenician woman story, then you are correct. There is no such thing as an external, authentic self, right? If you can argue your case and win the argument, then you've done what you can do. And that's why Judaism has things like the, the Talmud and others that are basically scholars throughout time arguing about scripture. But they're not killing each other afterwards. So if we look at the, the Syrophoenician woman story through a lens of Jesus as a Jewish teacher, and, and that's why Amy Jo Levine is a New Testament professor, because she says, I don't know if he's divine. I don't think he's divine, but I think he was one of the greatest teachers Judaism has ever had by the way he constructs his arguments. So where does that leave us? Well, I, I think back to the call of the disciples of Andrew, we need to remember, Andrew's listed first. I'm always snarky, when, you know, my boy, Andrew. Now, his brother, Peter, gets all of the acclaim. But it's two sets of brothers, right? Andrew and Peter, James and John, known as the sons of Zebedee. And their lives are changed that day to go forth and fish for other people. So what does it mean for us to fish for other people? 
We had, we had a great time at the county fair yesterday, the Waukesha County Fair. And we were surprised there was not only one, but there were two vendors selling flagpoles. And my sister said, how many flagpoles do you need and how many flagpole salespeople do you actually need? And then we got to like what we would describe as the religious section of the, of the county fair. You know, are you going to heaven? Let me tell you about Jesus. Or come through this bus where we've laid out what we think the, Gen the Garden of Eden in Genesis looked like. We, we did not walk through the bus. <clears throat> no, we, we were there for the food. We were there for the, the pork chop on a stick. And my sister has never met a cream puff that she didn't want to eat. So though I'll tell you, the, the strawberry shortcake was great, but I, I digress in all this. The point is, does our faith call us to argue with people what we would call um, apologetics? That's the Christian study of I am going to convert Don whatever it takes. Or does our faith call us when we're fishing for disciples, does it call us to be more like Jesus with the Syrophoenician woman and say, huh, you make a very valid point. Does our faith lead us to be open about our faith or closed about our faith? Open to new ideas, to new thoughts, and, and open to the fact that we're not going to get along with everybody and be able to say, that was a good discussion, shake hands and walk away. Or are we called to be narrow in our thinking? And I am here to convert the world. We saw a wonderful show yesterday at the county fair. We saw the fire guy. I had never heard of this guy. A guy juggling flames. And let me tell you, it didn't make me want to go home and learn how to juggle fire. But I did appreciate the craft, the years of study, that he didn't burn himself, or at least we couldn't tell if he burned himself. And he was funny. It was a comedy routine along with riding on, what is it, a motorized skateboard while he's juggling torches of flame. Like it was impressive. We thought we were only gonna watch for like five minutes and we stayed for the whole thing, which was like having our along. But he had a greater impact yesterday with the people that stood and watched than the folks who were like, I'm gonna go into the Genesis walk and see what it was. That's just my conjecture. I don't know, I, I can't tell you how many people walked through it. But the impression that's in my mind is the one who is engaging and playful and funny with as many dad jokes as you could literally muster. And to me, I think that's what faith is about. So when Jesus says, fish for people, that's what we're called to do. Not, not to juggle fire, looking at all the kids, but called to engage with people around us, to be open-minded, to have a sense of humor, to enjoy this world that God has given us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Wonderful God, you know our joys, you know our concerns, you know everything in between before we even name them, but we are grateful for the opportunity to come to you, to hand over the things that pain us and, and hand over our joys as well. We pray for Claudia's grandmother uh, as she is battling ovarian cancer and we, we ask that you be with all those who are battling cancer, all those who are undergoing chemotherapy and radiation and other treatments. We ask that you be with Phyllis and Paul's daughter having surgery this week and all those who are having surgery in the coming weeks. We pray prayers of gratitude for the ability to travel, to, to surprise family with visits, and also to just enjoy the summer. We ask for travel mercies for all those who are traveling, uh, especially for the Kilpatricks as they go to say goodbye to Christie's mother. We ask for your blessings in our lives, blessings of this, this community being able to gather for worship, the joy of seeing each other, the joy of fellowshipping with each other. 
we are grateful for all the beautiful moments in our lives of, <clears throat> of birthdays and anniversaries and times of celebration. We're grateful for those who have had a birthday or have a birthday coming that we may celebrate with them. We are grateful for your claim on our lives, a claim for us to be open to others, to share with others, to love others. By through that, we are faithful to you. We pray for your entire church, not just the people in the room right now, but our whole congregation and, and all the congregations around us that are doing your work. We're grateful for them and we're grateful for the opportunity to serve. We ask that you be with our leaders, both in our country and the leaders of the world, that they may make decisions that, that lift up your peace and lift up your grace. We pray not just for I and others have said out loud, but we pray the prayers that are deepest within us. We pray all of this in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, who taught disciples of all nations to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Are we open with our faith, or are we narrow with our faith? Ultimately, the, the choice is ours. So let's live this week being inviting to others in thought and word and deed. Friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and all those whom you love and all those whom God calls you to love. From now until our Lord comes again in glory. Amen. Amen.